Um, okay, so today I'm going to try to walk you through a journey through Star Formation and its fireworks. Um, my name is Ruben Fedriani, and I have prepared a few slides about myself because I've been informed that you guys are, you know, high school students or maybe starting university. So I thought it may be useful actually to know what I did to be here today talking to you. So uh, this is a little bit about myself. Uh, so I am from the south of Spain, Cadiz in Andalusia. And what I did to be here today, I did my bachelor in mathematics in the University of Cadiz, uh, in, in Sarlin University in Germany, and in Complutense of Madrid in, in the capital of Spain. Then I actually made my final uh, a bachelor undergrad thesis in astrophysics, actually, in star formation in galaxies. So that caught me. That I got very interested in it, and I did my master in astrophysics, also in the University Complutense of Madrid. Um, and I had the great fortune to be able to make an internship in the European Space Agency, also in Madrid, where I made my uh, master thesis. After that, I was completely lost uh, with astrophysics, like I really fell in love with it, and I did my PhD in astrophysics, this time in Ireland, in Dublin, in the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies and the University College Dublin, where I got my doctorate degree. Today, I am a postdoctoral fellow uh, in Chalmers University of Technology here in Gothenburg uh, since more than a year, and, and I'll continue like that for, for a few more years. Okay, um, I thought also that it would be interesting to see the map of Fira and how it has been moving around. So this is the same information as I told you before. I, I'm from here, from this little corner in the south of Spain, and I've been moving norther and norther with the past of the years. And now I'm right here in Gothenburg. So I don't know if the next step is going to be in the North Pole. I don't know, but let's see. Okay, this is a little bit about myself. Uh, let's continue with the main topic of this talk uh, about uh, astrophysics and star formation. But first of all, <clears throat> let me explain you, or let me give you my opinion why astrophysics is important, not only for, uh, for us astronomers, but for everybody. Actually, I'm gonna give you three examples uh, of how astronomy has impacted our lives and, and in a great, actually, uh, importance. And those reasons actually fit in the pocket of your uh, trouser. And, I, I, I'll, and you'll, you'll, you'll see now in a few seconds. The first reason is actually the GPS, the Global Position System. We every day use uh, the GPS to find a shop or to find the bakery that we want to, uh, to buy our bread. Or if we make some traveling, we put in the car and, the, and we put Google Maps and say, okay, bring me from point A to point B. But did you know, guys, that uh, without Einstein, actually, <coughs> the um, Einstein theory of re uh, relativity in, in 1960, that actually got proven later on, three years later, by Sir uh, Eddington in 19, uh, 1919, in the, using the solar eclipse that actually happened in Sobral and in Prince Island, uh, we would be actually uh, off every day uh, by more than uh, 10 kilometers a day. That means that we would be off by a year because the errors accumulate more than 3,000 kilometers a year. And thanks to Einstein and, and later on confirmed by Eddington, uh, the accuracy of the GPS that we normally use in our pockets with the phone are accurate to five to 10 meters. So you, you can't appreciate that without theory of relativity, we would be off by a lot because it doesn't really matter if you try to go to that, you know, to the bakery or to that restaurant and maybe Google Maps sometimes is not very accurate, but it's only a few meters. Imagine that you want to go to, to a restaurant here in Gothenburg and says, you know, go to, to Malmo instead. So that's a big problem, right? Okay, another reason, and this is really, really, really important as before, is the Wi-Fi. You know, in the 80s, 90s, there was a big movement to try to bring up this uh, Wi-Fi to this wireless technology into, into the market. But it was really, really difficult. And it was only until 1990s, in 1993 actually, where an Australian 
Ready Astronomer Group actually set the basis for the, you know, for the current high-speed Wi-Fi using fast Fourier transform. Uh, so this is another thing that actually we own to astronomy that we are using today, this connection actually through Wi-Fi and talking to you right now. Uh, last but not least is the so-called CCD. This is the coupled charge device. And this is this little tiny uh, chip that actually uses is used in the Hubble Space Telescope. But this same technology, this is used to actually capture the photons from the universe, from galaxies, stars, and or any other astronomical object. But thanks to this um, development in astronomy, it became so easy, well, not so easy, but so cheap to develop really good CCDs that we can, it's the same system, the same technology that we use today in our phones. So this is just three reasons that actually fits in your pocket why astrophysics is so important for everybody. Okay, so I hope that you guys take note of this and tell everybody that astrophysics is really important for us. But we're here today to talk a little bit more about star formation. So why is important star formation inside astrophysics? So I've written here, it's not only because stars are the building blocks of galaxies, not only of our own, this is the Milky Way, but also in other galaxies like M74 that is shown here on M55, this uh, beautiful spiral galaxy here that is, is basically conform of gas and dust, but the, ma the main building blocks are stars. That is not the only reason, which is, is important enough already, but also because the stars are the hosts of exoplanets. Without star, you know, the, the, they need a star to be surrounded by exoplanets. And why it's important actually in the first place is because we are living, you know, in a stellar system and we're just in the right place that actually allows us to, you know, to be alive and to be talking to you guys today. But we're interested to find if there are more exoplanets out there because just, you know, a few decades ago, we only thought that the only planets around us, they are the only one that exist, but we know that exist many more. Actually, as today, I, I checked out the NASA Exoplanet Exploration webpage, and as today, there are 4,352 confirmed exoplanets from which maybe some of them are uh, actually habitable. That means that in the habitable zone, uh, that means that they are in the right place to support water, uh, liquid water. Because if you are too far, they may be frozen. If you are too hot, you are too close, you may be too hot, and water may not exist because this is the only way that we know up to today that li life exists. You need water for that. Okay, so those are two main reasons why inside astrophysics, star formation is important. Okay, so now a little bit more uh, broader uh, cycle of stellar birth and death. Let me, let me spend here a few minutes to tell you what is this cycle about. <clears throat> so in, in the galaxy, there are the, the so-called diffuse clouds or molecular clouds that are sitting around the galaxy. And for some mechanism that it could be uh, either cloud collapse or cloud-cloud uh, collision, or maybe triggering from supernova remnant, this uh, dense clouds start to collapse. Then it collapses farther, farther, it creates a few cores that start to develop this star and planet formation. I'm gonna tell you uh, now in the next slide a little bit more about this exact process. Uh, while this star is forming, uh, we are forming planets as well, okay? And uh, when all this gas and dust is cleared, we have our John Proto uh, planetary system here. And if uh, this continues on, you know, the life of the star, the stellar cycle, and so on, that I'm not going to uh, explain in detail today, but I can tell you that if you are a star with more than eight solar masses, you will end up your life very violently, one of the most violent events in astrophysics, which is, you know, a supernova. This is if you are uh, above uh, eight, um, eight solar masses. Uh, these stars uh, enrich the environment with heavy elements. The, these are heavier than iron, and they re-inject in this diffuse cloud, and you've got this cycle 
of stellar birth and death that actually uh, feed into each other. And this is the reason that we have all those elements in, uh, on Earth today. Okay, uh, focusing a little bit more in this uh, um, process of star formation, I'm going to tell you now what we understand by low mass star formation. Those are the stars similar to our sun, uh, like one solar mass or so. This first panel uh, is the molecular cloud that I told you before that hosts a few cores that are, again, collapsing gravitationally. There are a few different classes in this uh, formation that we have separated into class zero, class one, two, and three. The difference between them is basically the age and the processes that are happening. You see here on the left of each uh, little panel, the, the million years that has passed or are, are elapsed up to this class. So in this first class, you've got the central uh, core that is the future star that is accreting material from this accretion disk that comes from the gravitational collapse of the molecular cloud. And by the conservation of angular momentum, you've got something that is rotating a little bit, that is roundish, and it starts to flatten into an accretion disk. This is the same principle of ice skating uh, athletes that when they open their arm, they go slower, and then when they close their arm, they go super fast. So it's the same principle. Uh, the direct consequence of these disks are protostellar outflows or jets that are actually uh, in place uh, always that there is a, a disk in here. Okay. So we go past to class one, where the core starts to be visible uh, and is still got a strong bipolar jet in here. Uh, these are uh, young, pro uh, young protostars, actually. They're still very young and still accreting material uh, uh, heavily. <clears throat> and then we go to the class two, where the accretion is a little bit less than in, in the case of class one. Uh, and you start to see uh, the center of vision in the infrared. I'm going to say a few more words about the electromagnetic spectrum in a few minutes. Finally, you go through the transition phase where you start to, you know, to disperse and to clear all the environment. And finally, you end up with your planetary system that, you know, we, uh, we, all, we all know very well because it's, it's, it's like our solar system. As I told you before, um, these planets are forming at the same time of uh, the star. Okay, they are forming in the so-called protoplanetary disk, and this is what I'm showing you in this slide. That, uh, to be clear, this is an artist impression. This is not a real observation. This would be great, but we have the central source basically here, and a thin disk of, of gas and dust where little planets start to be visible to us. Okay, that was an artist's impression, but let me show you an actual image. This is an image from ALMA, this is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, uh, back in Chile, uh, above 5,000 meters, and this is dust emission, and you see that one tiny pixel in this image is the central source, and you have a, a large disk. So if you look closely, you can see very clearly that there are gaps, this, these dark lanes here. There are some theories that say that this lane, this dark spot has been carved by forming plants. So this is really, really exciting. It was back in 2015 and changed astronomy, the protoplanetary astronomy field. But now, as today, th there are many, many more. There are like a survey of uh, several protoplanetary disks that show really interesting um, features here. Uh, more uh, rings and, you know, even a spiral arm. So really uh, good environment to form planets and, you know, really diverse environment. Okay, I also mentioned the word jet and outflow. These are the natural consequence of disks, right? And this is what you see here. If it's the first time that you're seeing these kind of uh, images, you have to think it about like a water fountain, you know, when you go to like a nice uh, city and you see a fountain that is blasting jets up, water this is similar, but instead of a fountain, there is a star that you cannot see in the middle. It's obscure because of the wavelength. It's blocked by gas and dust. 
but is ejecting all these knots. This is in particular molecular hydrogen that is being seen here. And just to appreciate how big these things are, this is 10,000 AU, this uh, physical scale here bar, so it's way bigger than 10,000 AU. Remember, you probably know this, but one AU is the mean distance between the sun and our Earth. So yeah, just make the math there, it's, it's just massive. Okay, so if you are lucky enough to have several images of the same object, you can create these movies that shows the proper motion, that is the motion of the source in the sky, and you see that actually moves really, really fast. They move up to kilo, uh, a thousand kilometers per second. They're really, really fast, definitely supersonic. And you also, uh, this is not that clear in this case, but you see how it moves, but in the right place, you see how this little, uh, say plane, which is actually the accretion disk, is really obscure. And this is because the same reason as before, is because they are so obscure that light gets blocked at those wavelengths. But you see the jet perfectly shooting out, right? Okay, how are these jets uh, launched? Or, um, you know, uh, what are the proposed launching mechanism? Uh, I'm telling you in this, in this slide, there are two main launching mechanisms uh, proposed for the low mass regime. Um, these are the disk wind, actually, uh, and the X wind. So let me walk you through this graph because it's a little bit complicated. So you've got the protostar in the middle that is forming, and this, um, these lines represent the accretion disk that you saw before, the protoplanetary disk. And these lines represent the uh, magnetic field that is attached to the disk, okay? And likewise in this, uh, in this diagram as well, you have the central star, the, um, the disk that, that the star is accreting through some mechanism that I'm not gonna go into today, and there are more uh, field lines from the magnetic field. Okay, so coming back here to the disk wing, the uh, jet is launched by this disk using uh, these magnetic field lines. And the main difference between the two, because this is also happening here, is that in the disk wing case, you've got uh, launching from every point of the disk, whereas in the X-wing model, you only launched or mainly launched the jet from the X, uh, the corotation radius, so-called, this is X point, okay? So this is the main difference between the two. Okay, so now after this heavy plot, let me show you a nice movie that summarizes everything that I have said up to now. So imagine that this, uh, this little thing is our uh, star that is accreting, the protostar, um, is using this accretion disk to get onto the source. And as I, as I just said, through uh, magnetic fields or you know, a combination between disk and the star is blasting this Powerful, powerful outflow into the interstellar medium, actually, that clears all the environment. Also, I have to say that uh, this jet helps to the angular momentum conservation problem because they think uh, rotates fast, but then when you see the form star, they, don't, they do not rotate that fast. So the angular momentum has to go somewhere. They, it, it conserves, so it cannot just disappear. So one of the solutions that has been proposed is that these jets carry out angular momentum. Okay, so this is been for low mass stars, which are well known because there are many and they're nice behaving and so on. But what my main field of uh, um, research is about is high mass star formation. What is a high mass? Massive stars are those with more than eight solar masses. Their masses are greater than eight, as I, as I said before. They will explode as supernovae, uh, and they will produce many chemical elements, as written here, like oxygen. So quoting Carl Sagan, you know, the, the nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the air in our blood, and the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interior or collapsing stars, so we're made of stardust. I couldn't agree more on that. But I tell you more, 
the star, massive stars are the responsible for heavier elements than iron because lower mass stars can only fuse up to iron. Okay, but massive stars, when they explore, when they explode and they die, they, they produce heavier elements that you see here as the oxygen. Okay, so we want to know how they are born. And there are two main theories, which they're not quite the same as the low mass because there are some differences. The main one being the mass, because this is very important. There are two main theories, as I just said. On the, on the left side, we, I have written here core accretion. This could be considered as a scaled version of the low mass regime. So you have one uh, you know, molecular cloud that is gravitational collapsing, and you've got one central object with an accretion disk and this outflow going up. So this is a little bit more, you know, uh, ordered, a little bit less chaotic. And on the red hand side, uh, we have the competitive accretion. This competitive accretion is more chaotic and turbulent in the sense that uh, these, there are many, many stars forming at the same time, and they are actually borrowing mass from the surrounding stars. And the most massive star are always, uh, given this theory, always form at the center of cluster, which means that there are many other stars, lower massive stars, surrounding our most massive star. What you're seeing here in this movie, this is a simulation, an actual simulation with uh, laws of mathematics and physics inside. This is not an artist's impression, this is uh, actual physics going on. You see the density uh, in color code, so the brighter, the more stuff in there. And you see all these little dots that are going around. Those are stars that are just being formed. Obviously, the simulation goes really fast in time because otherwise we couldn't, we couldn't wait for it. But the main takeaway message from this slide is that there are two main uh, theories that are formation theories. One of them is the isolated formation and the other is the crowded formation, meaning that massive stars can form alone or they can form with many more other uh, lower mass sources. Okay. So up to now, we have talked about theory and so on, but let, let's focus now on the observations because I am an astronomer, an observational astronomer, and we need to understand observations to, uh, we need to observe to understand theory because otherwise we couldn't test it. Okay, so let me spend a few minutes on the electromagnetic spectrum and the atmospheric transmission because when you observe, you need to know where to observe, what to observe, and how. Um, this is, uh, as you know, this is the electromagnetic spectrum going from short wavelengths as the gamma ray all the way up to radio wavelengths, which are the long, the longest. You see here this tiny bit. This is the visible spectrum. This is what our eyes can see, right? And just to give you a sense of uh, what we're we talking about, this is about the size of what you see at this wavelength. These are the atomic nuclei, the actual atoms, molecules. These are protosomes. <laughs> this is the head of the needle, butterflies, humans, and buildings, right? And then uh, I put here, right here, the source of emission. This means uh, where can you find this radiation, right? Uh, do you find this uh, really energetic radiation in radioactive elements, for example, in nuclear uh, stations? Oh. Then uh, these ones are the X-ray, the one that you, when you break your bone, you go to the hospital and get your X-ray done. These are the wavelengths that, that are there, and so on and so forth, until, you know, microwave, the one that you, you will make your food and so on. Right. But uh, we've got an atmosphere, right? We cannot observe everything from ground. Uh, this is very well seen in this diagram where you see this, again, this visible window that it goes all the way down to the Earth. So wonder why do we see visible light? Because our eyes through history has become, you know, uh, sensitive to this visible light. Going from blue, no, the shortest, to red, the the longest wavelength in the visible range. But we have a whole other story right here from short wavelength to long wavelength. However, as you see here, I'm showing you the transmission of the atmosphere. That means 
that the light at that wavelength get blocked. Actually, thankfully, because a short wavelength, gamma ray, and X-ray, really extreme light that actually can be harmful for us. So thankfully, our atmosphere blocks them, and it, it, it doesn't get to, to the surface where we would be harmed. So to observe at those wavelengths, we need to send satellite up in the sky if we want to observe the most energetic environment in, in the atmosphere, in the atmosphere, sorry, in the in the universe. Then if we go a little bit down here to, to longer wavelength, we enter in the so-called optical window. This is, as I just said, uh, where we actually see and where our telescopes are um, working in the optical, for example, um, you know, the one that Galileo used uh, in back in the 17th century. However, you may have noticed when, when there is sort of like a humid day or whatever, you, you look in the, into the horizon and you see like a glazy uh, view of whatever you are looking at. So we actually need real clear skies. For that reason, uh, there is this little mountain here that represents that we put the telescope, professional telescope, up in the mountains to uh, avoid all, you know, the clouds, to avoid the rain, and so on and so forth. Right. Even though that we go to high mountains, atmosphere is still there. So to have the sharpest images in the universe, uh, we need to go to space again. And this is the Hubble Space Telescope. And in the future, the James Webb Space Telescope. The, the longer the wavelength you go here in the infrared, um, in the infrared regime, <clears throat> you see that it's blocked. So you either go to planes, I'm going to show you a picture now, or you go to space again, because the light is blocked and you cannot observe it in the long, uh, in the so-called mid and far infrared, okay, because it's far. And then again, there is the radio wind that is completely transparent. That's why actually we have telescopes, you know, all over the world, but in particular, we have right, uh, right one here next to, next to Gothenburg in Onsala, there is this uh, a 20 meter telescope that observes in this radio wind. Okay, so you can have a radio telescope almost anywhere. Okay, so let me show you one figure to uh, show you to, to come to appreciate how important it is to look at different waves. What I show you here is the so-called um, Bok Global. Okay, it's, uh, it's this dark lane, uh, dark spot in the sky that actually is related. I don't know if you heard about, but uh, this uh, famous saying of William Herschel that are holes in the sky. This is what he was actually seeing. He was observing, you know, patches in the sky because in the visible light, these are the bands, okay, that he was observing, well, that this image was taken. You cannot see what is inside because the gas and dust is blocking what is behind. But if we observe a longer wavelength here, uh, uh, this is the infrared in K-band, you see what is back in, in behind this clone, okay? So this is why it's important to, to observe different wavelengths uh, and to come to appreciate that different wavelengths also traces different processes. Okay, so let me show you a few images of the telescope that I personally use for my own research. This is the very large telescope uh, in Chile, uh, and you've got these four massive telescopes. They are like uh, eight meters, the diameter of the telescope. Um, I show you here a couple of images, and you may ask me, well, what are these like? So they are lasers. They are to create artificial stars to help to modify or to help to correct the atmosphere, uh, the turbulent atmosphere. Okay, so if you create a, a star in the sky that you know that, uh, what it is and so on, and you correct uh, the mirror of the telescope real to, to modify and to improve your image quality, basically. I took this photo myself, actually. I was fortunate enough to go to, uh, to the Canary Islands and to, uh, and to be able to visit this uh, Gran Tecan, uh, Gran Telescopio de Canarias. And this is just unbelievable, guys. It's just like, you have to imagine a, a building of six or seven stories. This is how big this dome is. Okay, so as, uh, as promised, uh, I also use for my own research this flying observatory, so-called SOFIA. And it's called like a 2.8 meter uh, telescope inside, and it goes all around the sky and observes uh, the universe. And finally, we can always go a little bit up. And I also use for my own research the Hubble Space Telescope, that, you, as you know, is orbiting Earth 
and has bring us uh, one of the most outstanding images of of the year. Uh, just one curiosity, I think is is nice to say is that uh, um, the Hubble Space Telescope has been changing now instruments and so on. And just to appreciate how big this thing is, there has been many missions to replace uh, cameras or to fix stuff. And this is a little astronaut here inside the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, right. So here for the introduction, let me tell you a little bit, a little bit more about the research that we're conducting here in Chalmers. Let me begin with some open questions that, that I have come out for, for today. Um, and we, we wonder, how are massive protostars are born? Are they surrounded by several lower massive stars? Uh, this is motivated by, by the previous theory that I showed you. Plus, uh, since I'm most interested in jets and outflows, can these jets help us to discriminate between models? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a little bit more about that. To tackle these questions, we, uh, our group, uh, have uh, started this uh, the Sophia Massive Star Formation Survey, or uh, for short, the SOMA Survey. This is to try to answer the most fundamental questions in high mass star formation. These are all the members, some of the members that are in the group. And um, uh, so far, the SOMA Survey has observed 50 massive protostars with the plane that I showed you before, with the Sophia forecast in the mid infrared, that is from 7 to 40 microns. And what I'm showing you here in the background is a sample of these protostars, as, as you can see, that are shining at different uh, lights. Here are, uh, are the color correspondence. Right, so the way we do it uh, is uh, this being some theory. Uh, relative transfer models uh, that try to explain this formation. And to that, uh, we create a spectral energy distributions. That is, we measure uh, the properties at that specific wavelength, and we create the so-called SED, the spectral energy distribution. And we fit models. And these models are associated with several properties of these massive protesters, in particular, the mass of the core that they're forming, the mass of first density, the mass of the central protostar, and so on and so forth. With these images, the, the SOMA images, we can also measure the flux properties. Uh, this is what is shown right here, but we're not going to focus today on that. But the main thing that you need to take into account is uh, this geometry of the massive protostar that you have one star in the middle, then you have the accretion disk, and the outflow shooting out. Okay, Keeping, keep that in the back of your mind. Right, so as I said, so far, 50 massive protostars have been observed. Uh, this, we do that because <clears throat> the more stars you have, the more different environment you can, uh, you can study and the most robust conclusion you can draw. Right, uh, however, there is something that was missing in the SOMA survey, and this is the part that I am leading, and that was the near infrared component, right? Let me tell you why near infrared and jets are important. Again, this is a naive impression. This is an artist's impression of a proto um, a protostar system with the central star there, with the accretion disk around here, and the protostellar jet shooting out. What happens though? We don't have a direct view of the star because it's obscured by gas and dust from the, the parental cloud. However, we still have a clear view of the jet because it's being clear, right? So apart from this, uh, the near infrared has a greater angular resolution with respect to, to the Sophia imaging in the mid infrared. These images from Sophia have like a re around three or seconds. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this term, but basically not, the angular resolution is how fine detail you can see in the sky. So if you have like two sources, this separated, but you, you only see my hand because you don't see enough, basically. However, in the near infrared, we can differentiate finer detail, which means that we can more accurately find point sources. This was one of the questions at the beginning and describe the geometry of the protostellar jet. 
Uh, I just want to show this, uh, the, uh, these two images uh, because I'm going to show some, uh, some results now that have been helped by uh, this, uh, these two students, Ethan Duncan and Ana Costa Silva, uh, that we worked during the summer uh, in, in Chalmers, actually. Um, and this is part of this uh, near-infrared SOMA survey or uh, part of the survey. And the main goals, as you may imagine, are to describe accurately the alpha geometry <clears throat> and to explore the vicinity of the protostar to find more stars and to see how these massive protostars are, you know, behaving and so on, and to measure uh, some properties that today I'm not going to uh, go into more detail. To do that, uh, I, we are using the large binocular telescope that is shown here. This is also a really big telescope uh, that is, they are twins telescopes, actually. Uh, these are a little zoom in. I have to say that this mirror is eight meter big, I mean, in, in diameter. So it's just <laughs> really, really large. Uh, on top of that, we also use the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, which allows us to create these really nice images. So uh, following on with these images, I'm going to show you now a number of uh, sources that we have been working on in, the, in these few uh, months. Uh, before that, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain, I don't know if you know this, but uh, I think it's important to know that when we show an astronomical image, unless it's, you know, as you can see with your eye, we normally associate the so-called RGB, red, green, and blue colors to these filters. So what I'm showing you here is, the, um, is one of the, pro, uh, of the protostars that are part from the survey, from the sample. And uh, we took images from the Hubble Space Telescope, as I said, in three different filters. Here, the waveform, okay, they are in microns. The importance of observing the same protostar or the same system with, this, uh, with different wavelengths is because they tell us a different part of the story. So we give them colors, right, blue, green, and red, and then we match them. I mean, we, we combine them and we create this kind of like beautiful images where we can see the physics that has been going on because red colors in this, uh, in, in this particular image are showing shock material from the jet, right? So if you've never seen uh, an image similar to this, what we're looking at is the source, if you see my cursor there, is the central source that is shooting plus this outflow out there, right? And there are many, many stars around it. And you see this obscuration because the near infrared wavelength cannot escape this uh, density of gas and dust. Let me show you another uh, source, the, the, the so called AFGL 5180. <clears throat> this is another a massive protostellar um, system where, again, you don't see the massive protostar because it's, it's obscured in there. I'm showing now the gray, uh, uh, the black, white and black image. This is what you normally get out from the telescope. But again, we observe it in three different filters that is tracing different parts of the story. So actually, if I show you, for example, if you pay attention now and you see between this one and this one, you see that things are actually appearing. And again, if we combine them in the three color image, where here you have the correspondence, you see different regions showing different colors. In this particular example, uh, what is shown very, very clearly is the H2, the molecular hydrogen. And the reason is because this is shocking against the interstellar medium and is, uh, is uh, producing this emission. Okay, this is again really big distances, like as hundreds of thousands of AU, this entire jet. <clears throat> right. We also have observation with HST, and you come to appreciate uh, that uh, they are shining in different wavelengths and so on and so forth. So as I said, you have the central source here obscured, you cannot see it, but you see what is escaping from it because uh, this outflow has been cleared as, uh, you know, you have to picture it as the water fountain that is clearly in the dust. And you see all these uh, little shapes that can remind you to different things, actually, like the, the face of a god or something like that. Right. So uh, now I'm going to tell you a little bit more in detail for one of these sources. Uh, this is the, the source IRAS 16562-3959, but I'm going to call it 
IDA 16 for short. Again, on the left, I'm showing an HST image, Hubble Space Telescope, in, in three different filters, uh, J, H, and iron forbidden 2. Okay, this is the reddish colors here that you can see. That again is shock material. This is tracing perfectly the jet from the center source. And this yellowish is showing, is showing you the outflow cavity. That means what it has been cleared, okay? So now uh, we're gonna use this particular source. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a, a few slides to test. Uh, uh, this is the test case for estimating stellar number density. And this is to compare against competitive accretion models to see what we actually observe matches or not the models and simulations. And also, uh, we are gonna retrieve the jet geometry, in particular the opening angle, and you know why that is important in a few minutes. Right. Um, the stellar number density. Uh, we basically count how many stars, if you were to simulate the formation of a massive protostar, following the competitive accretion model, you would end up with a number of stars, right? And then if you go to your image and count the number of stars, you can have an estimate of uh, the stellar number density. So you count the number of stars, you measure the volume of a sphere, basically, that is inside this, and you can um, estimate the so-called stellar number density here, okay? Uh, in this simulation from 1 et al. Uh, 2010, uh, roughly there are more than 75 stars in a radius of 0 0.1 parsec. Remember that a parsec is, um, is a measure of length. For example, the closest, proto uh, the closest star to our sun is 3.3, sorry, 4.3 parsecs away, okay? So the closest star to us is 4.3 parsecs away. So this is a region that we have counted stars, and that implies that there are uh, more than 18,000 stars per cubic parsec. However, in our near infrared images, we estimated around five stars in, in this same radius of 0 0.1 parsec, which implies around 1,200 stars per cubic parsec. This means that this particular source does not seem to align with competitive accretion estimates or models. Okay, so that's for, for this stellar number density estimate. Let me show you now something that we have developed, an algorithm to come out with an objective way to measure the opening angle. So this is the same image, but now I'm showing just one filter. This is the H-man. And, uh, and this is what is shown in this grayish, uh, this is just a color that I chose for the color map, okay? So what we did was to measure the intensity in many, 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 many tiny regions to locate uh, what is the shadow line. The, the objective of this exercise is to measure where this, um, this shadow line appears, basically. Um, and you may, you may say, well, what is that? <laughs> okay, so again, if, if you have the central source in here, this opens up a cone. Okay, uh, and what you see now as greenish is the sky. So there is nothing in there. And what you see as yellowish is what we're interested in. So you can more or less by eye say, okay, this is around, I don't know, 30, 40 degrees, but we need an objective way. We, we need a, an algorithm to do that. And we did so. And measuring, we obtained this, which is pretty accurate, if you think about it. So we actually obtain these, all these dots that are measured by a gradient so uh, if you remember, the gradient is the maximum change, in this case, in brightness from one specific point. So for example, if you're here from here, you know that the gradient is in this particular case, that point. And we, we go on and along and we create this shape of, uh, of the jet. And finally, we have this result. Uh, you have the, the black line and then the shadow black which is sort of like the error, okay? Because in science, we always consider errors. Basically, this algorithm give us uh, an estimate of 23 plus minus three degrees. And you may ask, why are you telling me this? <laughs> why is this important? The reason is because our group, as I told you before, uh, is developing these core accretion models that fits all these parameters. 
you know, including the mass of the core, the surface density, the mass of the protostar, you know, the actual extension. There are many things that I haven't talked about, but they're really important for the model. In particular, the opening angle. That means that, for example, I show you, I give you the SED, the, the, the spectral energy distribution. And the model tells me, OK, these are the most likely um, you know, uh, models that explain the observations. However, you see here, the chi-square gives you an estimate of how good is, um, how good is the model. But you see, they're pretty close between each other. But in here, in this case, the opening angle changes. So with our observation from the HST, we can actually rule out a few models. So that gives us how important it is to uh, look at jets in the near infrared, basically. Okay? So we can, for example, say that probably this first model may not be the best after all. There may be some, some, something else. Okay, so now closing the loop of these open questions, uh, we, we wonder ourselves how are massive photos are born? Okay, with this talk, I'm not going to answer that because that's really, uh, a really naive here to think because we need to study many, many sources and so on. But what I can tell you is that from the observation that we have uh, taken, is those massive protostars, they don't seem to align with competitive accretion models. Okay, we need to uh, continue looking at that. In this same line, are they surrounded by many lower protostars? Are they not? <clears throat> From, again, from our observations, they uh, they do have uh, point sources, but not many. As, as I showed you before, there are a few, but not that many. I have to say here, though, that as I told you a few times already, is that certain lines get blocked by gas and dots. So maybe what happened in our images, we are just missing stars because they are just so embedded, they're so obscure, that you cannot see them. And finally, I think this is obvious. Can help? Can jets help us to discriminate between models? Yes, indeed. <laughs> they further constrain, in particular, the core accretion models. And there are many more observables that I didn't have the time to tell you about today. And just to finish off, guys, I want to give you uh, some future work or some future perspective, um, aka a look into the future, but also in the past. Because if you think about when you look to the universe, the farthest you look, the, the most in the past you look, actually. No, because light travels at a, at a maximum speed, which is the speed of light. So the, the farther you look, the farther you go in the past. So what we're going to do, we're going to continue using this uh, very large telescope, no, the, uh, this one in Chile, also this one in Arizona, the um, large binary ground telescope, but also we go to space, right? We will continue using the Hubble Space Telescope, and hopefully in the next few months it's going to be launched, uh, well, in, in, in the next uh, few months it's going to be launched the James Webb Space Telescope. This is the next generation. And also in the, in the next few years we're going to have the extremely large telescope. That is a telescope with a primary mirror of 39 meters. This in comparison to the others, are, are just a monument. It's just so large. And with these guys, I would like to end, and I will be very, very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I want to ask, can you show the, uh, the slide uh, which you uh, which you show that the angle, I mean, so that was a table on the angle. Yes. The one from the dimension in the angle of the angle? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me just go. Uh, next, next slide. Next. Next, yes, yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, and the next slide, so which, uh, when you uh, answer the, all of the questions, Uh, 
Can you hear or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, thank you very much. Uh, I have another question. Uh, what is those jets uh, made of? I mean, is that plasma or gamma rays or some other particles? That's a good question, actually. Uh, jets <laughs> are. Uh, I can show you maybe this one. Um, jets are made of gas, actually, but I, and we're investigating if there is any dust in the outflow. Actually, this is one uh, active. Um, after a field of research. What I show you here are basically atoms and molecules. Uh, in particular, in the near infrared, what you normally trace are, as I said, is iron. So you've got the, the iron in, in, a, in a gas, in a dust, in a tiny dust. And then because if it if collapses, um, it's being ejected and is collapsing against the terrestrial medium, it's going so fast, that iron gets out of the grain, basically. Okay, for example, the molecular hydrogen is also ejected and it's shocking again the entire medium. So asking, uh, answering your question uh, quickly, uh, they are made basically of gas in the form of atoms and molecules. And we're investigating now if they are also have any dust in the alpha. But this is our basically what they are form of. What you say about the gamma rays and so on and so forth, uh, not to be confused, the wavelength with the actual material that the jet is composed from, because you can observe the same jet at different wavelengths, and any every dif different wavelength is gonna tell you uh, a different story from the outflow. It's gonna tell you a different layer because the longer the wavelength, you may actually be observing another layer or a more energetic, a warmer. Okay, so if you go to shorter wavelength, you are tracing more energetic. Uh, phenomena. So, uh, for example, uh, the one that I've been showing you here are protostellar jets from stars, but they're also jets from galaxies. They are like, you know, from, from black holes and so on. If you want to trace those, you have to go to really energetic, uh, that is short wavelength to, uh, to trace them. Whereas in this case, you can, you can have a look in the optical, also in the, in the ultraviolet, which is also really energetic. But you can also go to a longer wavelength where you trace a, a less energetic part of it, but also very important. So they are basically made of, uh, as I said, gas, maybe dust, and you can trace it all the way from the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, can those jets uh, be similar to solar wind? To solar wind, they, they are different though. Uh, because the mechanisms are, are different. Solar winds are... Uh, I think the materials, I mean, not the uh, function, the materials, uh, what those made of, or something else. Well, I, I'm not an expert in, so, uh, in, in, in the sun, but as far as I know, I think the, the solar winds are mainly composed by plasma, like really, um, you know, plasma. Whereas in the case of these jets are, are also composed of other atoms and, and molecules. And as far as I am aware, I don't think in the solar wind you can have molecules, but I may be wrong. So uh, I would say no, they are not composed of the same. Thank you for a very interesting lecture. Uh, I think we have a question in the chat as well from, uh, okay, from Jonathan. So I could I could read it out loud. Um, it's why is protoplanets flat and not round like a globe? If I understand, let me. I don't think I understood the question. But if you think, for example, let me let me share my screen again. But they are not flat. The, the thing that you so, for example, in this uh, in this slide here that you see, this is an artist's impression on this as well, right? You may see as flat in the sense of 
like um like a disk, but they're actually spheres. The reason that you see us flat is because the projection effect, when you take an image in the sky, what you're doing is to project everything into a 2D image, right? So uh, when you when you actually see, for example, something like this, this is the jet again, you see sort of like a one two dimension thing. You, know, you have X and Y, but you have to appreciate that these things are actually 3D. However, when we take an image, we are only, um, you know, only seeing two D dimensions. So, uh, for example, uh, these two stars they may look as they are one two next to each other. But what happens that one is very close to us and the other is very far to us? When you take an image, you project everything on the same plane, so they seem to be uh, next to each other. So the same happens with the planets. They may look as they are flat, but they are not flat. They are spheres. Does that answer your question, Jonathan, or? Excellent. <laughs> OK. I have a question. Uh, I think question. you have another. Um, it's, I'm going to read out loud for the people that doesn't have uh, the chat. So he's asking, uh, why is some part of the protoplanet darker than others? Are they just thinner there, or is so? Or is it some other reason? OK, um, we don't have a direct image of a protoplanet uh, normally. OK, so uh, we, we normally have, or well, we do, actually. We have images of these um, uh, exoplanets, but we don't normally differentiate between the color of them. It's not like you are looking at Jupiter or you are looking at uh, Saturn, that you actually see different between uh, the colors the reason of the difference between the colors is actually the atmosphere, right? So, um, you know, taking your question a little bit more into the uh, solar system, that uh, the reason that some parts are darker and some parts are, are, are lighter is because of the composition of the um, atmosphere, right? And we actually can tell that even though we're not seeing the exoplanet itself, we can take a spectrum that is sort of like a radiography, like an X-ray of, of the exoplanet, and we can tell what is the composition of that exoplanet. So if we were to see as good as we see Jupiter, uh, we would actually would see the different colors. And the reason is because of the composition of the atmosphere. It may be also related to the thickness, but the main reason is, uh, is the atmosphere. Thank you, Jonathan. So if anybody does not have any question, I have an, another question. So uh, uh, maybe you heard that there is a region uh, so on the sun's surface which is uh, has higher te temperature and uh, the region uh, which is more close to the sun. So right, yes. I don't know. Oh, you heard that. Why is Cool. Right. So the the answer that I'm going to give you now, uh, as I said before, I, I'm not a solar uh, astronomer, and the answer that I'm going to give you now is that I uh, when I was doing my PhD, there was a group of astronomers that were studying the sun. So we were discussing over the coffee break or whatever about this, and I think what you're talking about is the co the corona of the of the sun. So you've got sort of like the surface of the sun is about 6,000 Kelvin more or less, but then when you go farther away, uh, you've got the corona of, uh, of this sun that can actually go up to millions of Kelvin if, if I'm right. The reason, I honestly don't know. <laughs> I don't know the reason, but I can speculate and think that maybe because of these solar winds, you know, that, uh, that are uh, being out, you know, it, it, it warms me somehow. But to be honest, I, I, I do not know the reason. Before giving you a wrong answer, I prefer to say I don't know. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? 
Um, I take that as a no. Uh, but then I would like to thank everyone who came and especially a big thank you to Ruben for teaching us.